Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring Lena Caesar Chavan. much for doing this we'll get into this as quickly as possible so you can get back to your family but um my first question as always to all my guests is where did your sense of duty come from so you know that that's an interesting question um related to politics because i think it came from before that so i owned a healthcare based research management firm and one of the the last projects i was working on was a national canada's first ever national epidemiology study on neurological conditions looking at scope impact health services and risk factors for 14 priority conditions like alzheimer's and parkinson's and um and it was across the age continuum and when you hear about the struggles that caregivers have looking after with children with epilepsy or parents with Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, looking after, you know, partners and the the hoops that they had to jump through, you know, moving to a new province because drugs aren't covered under one formula or another, uh, having to separate in order to get the benefits that they need. I think it stemmed from a sense of wanting to help people even through that time. And, um, And then realizing that you could do a lot of that policy work if you're in politics. (laughs) Now, did your parents serve in any capacity in a greater, grander scale or were they uh, very private people? No. So my parents, so I'm not first generation Canadian. I came here when I was two and my parents um, immigrated here in the 70s and really just worked hard to achieve, you know, the Canadian dream and uh, came with a hundred dollars in their pocket and hustled all the way through to uh, having a very successful life and, and retirement. And so it was, it was more of the, along the lines of we're coming to a new country, do the best that you can. Um, we had had conversations about my dad running in politics at, at some points in our life, but never anything that was taken too seriously. And I think even when I decided to run, people were like, okay, where's this coming from? It's kind of out of left field. So it wasn't really a discussion that we had at all. It was just a decision and I just decided to do it. Now, was Whitby their first choice? Did they, did they, when they moved here to Canada, when they immigrated to Canada, was Whitby the first choice or did they move around? Did you have a childhood that were moving around a lot? Because I know uh, my husband's an immigrant to Canada and he moved around a lot in Alberta and he is now in Calgary. So I'm just wondering if that was the same experience of yourself. So, you know, and this is going to sound very stereotypical, but when we moved uh, from Grenada, you move where the the elder siblings moved to. So we moved to Rexdale first, and I you know around that sort of Dixon Road area. <laughs> right? And uh, so we were we were at Rexdale Boulevard, and then we moved a couple times within Rexdale. And then when my parents' company took off, we moved to Brampton and owned a, a semi-detached there. And then we had a, a detached home in Brampton, and I. I think we stayed there from high all the way through high school straight until I got married. When I got married, I left and then moved to the East end. And then when I decided to start a family and, you know, get a house, our first home was in Whitby, but I grew up mainly in the, in the West end of Toronto between Rexdale and, and then Brampton. I I know the area quite well. I'm from the GTA as well. So I I know that area quite well. Um, (laughs) Uh, bef- we're going to be talking about this throughout the episode, but uh, there, there's one area that I want to touch on a little bit because I don't have the experience and uh, as a person of color, you do. And in your high school years, in your uh, junior uh, years, your senior, I'm not sure what they called it in, uh, like in uh, Clarington, where I'm from, it was senior public school and then uh, high school in senior public school where in Brampton, did you see forms of racism in Brampton? Um, so senior public, what grade would that be? Seven, eight. Oh, yeah. So that was still elementary school. And elementary okay. school in grade seven, eight, I had moved to our first house in Brampton. 
and no, sorry, our second, like our our last house in Brampton and uh, was in a split seven, eight class and then a grade eight class, obviously, and then high school. And really, Brampton at the time, I mean, I'm sure I was the only black girl in my class um, and never really noticed it. And then when I got into high school, it was, you know, it, they were real cliques, but you don't really notice some of the things. And it wasn't until I sort of looked back, um, I just finished writing my book. And of course, you have to look back and sort of remember things that you've forgotten and I remember leaving high school in, in four years. So I'd finished the five-year requirements in four years, was on the honor roll all four years, um, graduated top of my class and didn't get a single graduation award. And it wasn't until I looked back and I thought, wow, like, why didn't that, like, you know, why did that happen? And even even then I was, I was kind of still steered towards, you know, um, Nobody really talked to me about university. Nobody guided me in that way. My my parents did, but it was it was an interest. It was interesting to look back. I don't know if I felt it necessarily, but it was interesting to look back on it. And and again, I was smart, right? So I kind of played the system as much as possible, and I was cute. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you you play that system as much as possible, and you don't really have to you. It, within a school setting, you're not streamlined as much as the other kids because you're, I was just, and I was a, I was a mouthy. So I was smart and mouthy and my parents weren't having it. So it was a different, I think I have a different experience than a lot of, a, a lot of young people. Uh, when you say you're smart, you are not under, you are not lying about that. Uh, as I've dug deeper and deeper into your uh, uh, profile and your history and your biography, I have learned so much about you. And I, you, when I usually look at politicians, you always think, oh, they're politicians and that's all they've always been. They've always wanted to be politicians. So they've always done something to become a politician. But you went to, I just want to make sure I get this right here. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down because I have all my notes here. New College in Toronto, University yeah. of Phoenix. You're a, a PhD in biology? No, I, I'm doing my PhD in organizational leadership. Um, okay. I do have a number, I have two MBAs. I have an MBA in healthcare management and an executive MBA. So, so. <laughs> from my perspective, this is not someone's resume of someone who wants to go into politics. So this is someone <laughs> who wants to go into the healthcare field. Where did that come from? <laughs> So, so, you know, it's actually, it's quite funny because we just had our fifth year reunion for my um, M MBA class at Rotman. And I was on the phone on Friday night. We're talking, they're talking about, oh, Selena, you know, you've done so well since, since you left U of T and you know what's going on and, you know, how's politics. I said, I wouldn't have gotten into politics if it wasn't for you guys. So because during that, that MBA course, there's a, there's a politics during the program, there's a politics course. And during the politics course, they're talking about, you know, how in business you need to have political capital so that you're able to go to the Hill and, you know, influence policy related to business decisions related to policy and how trade happens, blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, hmm, that sounds interesting. And the next thing I knew, I was like, how do I get into politics? Because I've never done that. I think that would be kind of cool. And so I literally in December of 2013, had a meeting with these. So we had our year end dinner with the women in the EMBA program. There were 19. And I said, yo, what if, like after that class, but you know, what if we just got into politics? And by the end of the dinner, I had won an election. I was like going on to be prime minister. Like they were so excited about this. I had no choice, but, <laughs> but to then the following year in, in 2014, become a member of a political party and I became a member of the liberals and the well, rest is history. <laughs> and that's the, that's the by-election that you became nationally known. Uh, you uh, decided to run for the liberal party and that by-election was uh, due to the path, untimely passing of Jim Flaherty, the former finance minister. Um, and you were going up against one well-liked mayor at the time, Pat Perkins, the mayor of Whitby. And you still decided, was it a contested nomination? Do you mind me asking? Nobody, most people thought I was the lamb 
to the slaughter. Nobody wanted to join the lone lamb to the slaughter. It was not contested. <laughs> Uh, I had the same experience in 2015 when I ran for the Liberals. I ran in Northern Alberta and literally the moment after the nomination meeting, the person who was running it turned to me, the person from party headquarters turned to me and said, you have no chance in hell of winning. We're just putting you on the ballot. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks very much. So well, I think they thought the same for me too. Like it was, it was, it was, this is Flaherty country. It was Flaherty country. Like there was, there was no way that I was going to win, let alone even come close to, you know, because 2011, we were totally decimated. They were not expecting, they weren't expecting anything to happen. And I mean, the mayor, she was, she was a mayor for nine years, 17 years on council. It was like, this was just an impossible yeah, thanks. Thanks, Selena, for trying out. But <laughs> and no, was, thanks. Was uh, Jim Flaherty's wife still MPP at the time, too? She was. She was. Yeah, she actually resigned um, a little while after I got elected. And I was really I was I was really sad about that. I I gave her one of my favorite gifts that I usually give give women when she left. And I thought we would have been really good together in <laughs> in yeah. politics so well so like you said it was jim flaherty's country uh county whitby was jim flaherty right and christina elliott being the mpp there that election you did extremely well people were shocked at how close you came to winning that election were you um so i i looked at it as you know i lost by three thousand votes which was phenomenal, um, but I don't like to lose. <laughs> no one so, does. <laughs> so, so I was, I mean, the prime minister was there, was at my house with me when, when we were watching that by-election and he was totally ecstatic. He's like, you know, you're going to get her next time. And, you know, it's going to be, it's this is so great. Like, I can't believe. And, you know, everybody was hype. And I was just like, this sucks. I was not happy. Um, and it actually put me in a depression for two months. Like a well, serious, like not, um, I feel in a funk, but I could not get out of bed for two months after that, that by-election. Yeah. It was just so devastating. Cause I thought, you know, I literally was the lamb to the slaughter. And I just felt like everybody was looking at me and laughing at the lamb who got slaughtered. Um, so it is an area that I wanted to touch on us here as well, because you are open about that depression phase that you went through during those two months after you got elected in 2015. Why be so open about it? I, I know you need to tell your story so other people going through it can see someone that they can represent, someone that they feel like they can connect to. But as an elected official at the time, you must have felt it's going to be a double-edged sword. You're going to have the people who can connect with me, but also this people are going to say, Oh, I'm just getting you doing it for the sympathy. Right. Oh yeah. So, you know what? I really, I really didn't even think about those latter, that latter case, the people who are saying, you know, I'm doing it for there that people are going to talk about me anyway. I, I mean, no matter what I did, right or wrong, good or bad, I was, people are going to talk about me. So I, I wasn't, I wasn't really concerned with those individuals. What I was really concerned with was connecting with individuals who were feeling alone, number one, and then two, connecting with the people who were the Selena before 2015. So the Selena who wasn't interested in politics, who didn't really feel engaged, she felt marginalized because the people there were so distant and disconnected. And I thought, you know what, if I'm going to be to do politics differently, so to speak, then I need to be real in this role. I need to be um, authentic in this role. And if I'm not feeling well, then I, I, I the first two months of 2015 were bad. But the first two months of 2016, I had, you know, a, a, what they would call a nervous breakdown. I needed to people to understand that it was it's it's tough and it's not because the job is tough or it's not because I don't have thick enough skin. It's something's wrong with my brain and I need to have medication or 
therapy to fix it. And if we don't do that, then then that brings out a lot of trouble. And I think the last thing was around the time somebody had passed away on the hill. And I can't remember who, who the individual was, but I think his name was Hillier. But oh, no, I, I just thought, there's no way I'm going to let, like, I'm going to die here. Like, it was really scary. And I thought, if I just don't talk about things that are happening, how are people going to know that I'm scared or that I'm having a hard time or anything if I just pretend so the 29 the 2015 election comes around was there a thought in your head I'm not gonna do this it's not for me I had my shot I tried it I'm done or was it I need to beat her I need to beat Pat I need to show that I can actually win this riding and I'm not gonna be that person who's the the slaughter to the lambs anymore yeah so absolutely. And I, I remember, you know, my husband coming in and saying, you know, baby, you, you really need to get out of bed. Like you need to go see a doctor. This is, you know, you need to start campaigning. And me just thinking like, I can't get out of bed right now, but I'll be damned if I lose to Pat Perkins twice. So like, that was, <laughs> it's like, I can't get out of bed, but I know I need to do something. And it involves getting out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest motivator in the world is your <laughs> ego, right? Yes. <laughs> I am not losing again. <laughs> so I, I actually, I actually, between him and a, and a number of different supports and that sort of idea that, you, you, you know, I needed to do something different was able to, to get out of bed and, and say, yeah, no, I, I'm definitely going to run to it. And you know what? Even the night of the by-election, people kept coming up to me and saying, don't say that you're going to run again. Just keep it keep it to yourself. Do not go on national TV and say you're going to run again. What do I do? I go on national TV like, yes, I'm going to run again. And yeah, I'm going to beat her next time. Confidence, so, so ego. Jeez. Like, yeah, uh, it, it helps, you know. When it gets too much, that's when ego is bad. But it dry it drives my my personality, type A personality. I like to hustle. I like to get things done, and I like to get things done where I come out on top at the end. Um, so that by that the general election comes around, and you are uh, in a, a fight again. Flaherty country people are not expecting. But the tables are turning because the NDP were up and at some points, the Conservatives were up, and then the Liberals at the end of it sort of shot through the roof. Yes. You win. You you get your moment of glory here of to say, I, I did it. I beat Pat Perkins. <laughs> like, it's not I won. It's I beat Pat Perkins. Right. What was that feeling like that moment that night when you saw that Selena name on the uh, CTV, Global, CBC, whatever station you were watching with the little check mark beside it. <laughs> so that mo- so that, that's, a, that's a very good question and I never get asked this question. And um, so we're watching the, the, the votes come in and during the by-election, if you look at the results on Rogers local TV, <laughs> Yes. The, the results are coming in and they're oscillating back and forth, right? So I go ahead, then Pat goes ahead, I go ahead. And then at some point, like I'm watching it on TV, totally oblivious to the fact that the prime minister knows, or the leader at the time, knows who won way before it's announced, right? So then he's sitting beside me and he's like, you know what, Selena, you did a really good job. And you know, you know, you could get him next time. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? Does, Things not done yet. And he's like, you know, and at that time, Big Max, I can't remember his name. He he was uh, chief of staff for Minister Mono or for uh, like Max, I can't remember his name. But anyhow, he like looks at me and then dodges to go outside to have a smoke. And I go, Max, what happened? And he can't even say that you lost, right? So then now you fast forward to 2015. And the same thing is playing out again, but every single time the results come in, I'm going further and further ahead. We're not going back and forth between me and Pat. I'm just getting further and further and further. And so at one point, myself and my husband and, and my husband's dad go to a separate room and we're watching the results. And I just look and I go, we won. And at that point, my, my husband was kind of excited, but didn't want to you know, have that feeling of, 
well, maybe we didn't <laughs> win because <laughs> we, you know, you have to see that check mark. I knew we won, but I was petrified because you're right. I, I beat Pat Perkins. I didn't know what it actually meant to win. So what next? Like, well, what do I do now? And that was, I was like, okay, well, up till this point, I just said I wanted to be the voice of the people in Ottawa. And, you know, it sounded really good, but how do I do that? And so the reality of what I was about to get myself into, that stuck. And it was, a, I was petrified. And, and that's the same story, not the exact same story, but the the moment after, right? The moment after you're elected, it's it sinks in. And it's not the yeah. gradual sinks in. It's a sudden drop of what have I gotten myself into? Yes. <laughs> I now yes. have to represent 150,000 people in Ottawa and I no, have no political experience. Yes. So did you have someone that you could talk to the moment after because you're, you're relatively new to the liberal party so you don't know the insiders at that time but did you have a friend that you could say okay what what what's next or did you have the local and like did you talk to pat afterwards to say hey i know i just beat you after a by-election that you won what can you what advice can you give me um you know well I had one run in with Pat after at the the Legion Hall for a Remembrance Day dinner. And it was basically a threat that I received from her with a like some bad words. So I won't repeat what she said to me. And and I guess after that I realized that she wasn't gonna help me. <laughs> um, but I could have I could have spoken to Judy Longfield, who was the member of parliament previously and helped on my campaign that she was liberal. But I just I just, I didn't know, I, you know, I, I was in a state of this, this for, for at least a year, perpetual shock. Like, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I was just, I was it's like my brain froze for a little while because, and I don't actually know why I, I, I wrote about it in the book and it's the chapter that I hate the most. It's chapter 10. And I hate the chapter because I just sound so naive and dumb it's like, I, I just couldn't place myself. I couldn't get my footing underneath me for about a year um, to figure out how to do what I needed to do. Mind you, I, I did my meetings. I did the things that I, I, I needed to do, but not necessarily what I, what I was passionate about. I was kind of going through the motions so for a good had, year. You had that thud of, I've just been elected and uh, the uh, getting your footing. But I, mm-hmm. I have to ask the question, Walking on the House of Commons floor for the first time as an elected MP, what does that feel like? For the, for, because you are one of the very few people in this country who have had the honor to do that. What does that feel like? So it was, it was kind of surreal. And you know what, I don't think that that moment was sur- as surreal for me as my swearing in ceremony. So my swearing in ceremony happened in the reading room of Parliament Hill in Center Block. And in that room, there's this huge picture of the Fathers of Confederation. And that day I decided, again, they're going to talk about me anyways. I know I'm getting my official photograph done today. I'm wearing like this this faux leather Karl Lagerfeld dress with like this fur, faux fur neck thing and these, you know, BG, BCBG stilettos. Like I'm looking fierce to come in for this picture and it's my uncle who says to me like look at you this this black girl from Grenada under this enormous picture of the fathers of confederation like the audacity of you to believe that you could be here and for me that was the moment where and then they said you know every person who has been a member of parliament has signed their name into history and you will be next And that moment was like, holy moly, like this is, this is phenomenal. Like this, like this, this is the wildest dreams that people have, right? So for me, it was that moment. Then walking into the chamber was, was a a more sobering moment. It was, okay, now you actually have to read this stuff 
and make sure you do right by the people. That was, a, it was, it was less of a moment and more of a, whew, oh my goodness. Okay. This is where you need to take your stuff real serious because you need to represent people and you need to do it in a way that they know that you've read the material that you've listened to their concerns and that you've, you understand that if you go against what they want, you better have a darn good reason. So it was very sobering walking in there the first time. Um, you have said in a previous podcast that I listened to you um, that Selena is not, actually not your original name. It's your grandmother's name. And you uh, changed it to Selena to honor your grandmother. Um yeah. Honoring your grandmother in that way is, is a significant step and to sign your name and in essence, her name into that book. How, how did that feel? Uh, it was my grandmother, my great grandmother. It was, um, my grandmother asked me to change it to honor her mother. So, um, you know what, when I changed my name, I changed my name in 2012 ish, 2011, 2012, but it was officially changed. Um, Christine Elliott actually signed my name change uh, in 2013. And, you know, when that happened, I made a promise to make Selena epic. And signing, signing a legacy of women in that one signature, I'm signing a legacy of, of women, my mother, her mother, her mother into this, into history at the same time was just, uh, I, I, I can't even, it, it was a moment. It was, it was a moment. And when, and when you contextualize it in a place like parliament that was never designed for women to be there, never designed for women of color, where we still don't have dress codes for women, you really like, yeah, let me sign it. Let me sign it really big. <laughs> Give me the permanent marker. So the Donald Trump out. way, come on. <laughs> Um, you, you said that first year you were trying to find your footing, uh, that first year you were, uh, you have said in the past that you, you, you were there just to represent the people of Whitby, but the prime minister called on you to be parliamentary assistant to the prime minister. Um, so you had your role as a uh, new MP for Whitby and also this new other role on top of it to juggle those. How was it? That was an interesting experience. Uh, when I went to see the prime minister in December of 2015, when he asked me to be his, his parliamentary secretary, I, um, I said to him, I, I, let me be clear on a couple of things. <laughs> when black women say that, it's usually like, oh God, what's happening next? <laughs> so let me be clear. Um, number one, I hope that you didn't asked me to do this role to fill any racial or gender gaps that you had in your cabinet because I don't want it. I am perfectly happy being the member of parliament for Whitby. So this is what this is, a token role. I'm good. And he was very clear that uh, no, it wasn't. It was, you know, it was a role. It was based on merit and we had a great relationship, et cetera, et cetera. But as the, the year went on, I was very concerned about the lack of coordination and actual role or, or responsibility that came with that role uh, within that government. And when I left as parliamentary secretary in December of 2016, there was no longer a parliamentary secretary to the prime minister, the me and the title left. So, um, I, I say that to say, because again, I, I go back to chapter 10 in my book, the chapter that I hate um, is, is related to that, that year of having so much challenge with being paid extra to do this role, this, this role that had really no responsibility. And it was, it was a figurehead type role. And I, and, and at the end it was, it, I felt good knowing that I advocated enough for the removal of that role for the title to be removed altogether because it just didn't make any sense. You then were shuffled into international development, one area that yes. you said you really enjoyed. I what, loved it. What made it so enjoyable for you? Oh, because it's the greatest story Canada never tells. So Canada, we have Canadians 
across Canada, around the world, doing incredible work in incredibly difficult situations, uh, whether we're talking about drought or climate change or um, refugee crisis or war or displacement. They are just they are just doing some extreme work. And then a catastrophic event happens like a hurricane and they double down and do more. And the fact that they influenced heavily the feminist international assistance policy that we put forward in 2018 was so, sorry, in 2017 was so fundamental. It put women and girls at the center of everything that we did, which we should have been doing right from the beginning. And it was a, it was a real understanding of intersectional feminist policy where we knew that women in the global South had way different um, experiences when it came to gender-based violence, when it came to um, equal rights, where they couldn't own property, where they weren't educated. And that was in a foreign policy that was so critical to the development of the world. And when I went out to speak about it, it would be, oh my God, Canada's so far ahead. They're doing so great. And it also gave me an opportunity to say, whoa, 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 that doesn't mean we don't have our work to do here. You know, <laughs> we still have the national crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women. And it, it gave me an opportunity to elevate the conversation about, uh, about Canada's place in the international context, knowing that we were leaders, but we also we weren't being cocky about it. We also had our issues to deal with at home. And that's the one area that uh, conservatives like to jump on is uh, the liberals seem to like to spend their money in uh, around the world where we have so many problems here at home. You saw it firsthand of the work being done around the world to better the world at the same time as doing the work here in Canada. What would you say to conservatives who have the mindset that, you know what, we need to get rid of international development. We don't need it because we need to develop Canada first because we have our own problems. Well, they're not mutually exclusive, so you could do both. And I think if we don't do both, what we're going to see is continued uh, crisis around the world, continued displacement of people around the world. Right now, we have uh, refugees in camps that spend an average of 26 years. Could you imagine 20, 26 years of your life in those conditions when you're having children? Where, where, do, they, where do they grow? Where, what is the future for, for, for that kind of individual? Now, if we do not help now, do we have war later? Eventually somebody's gonna pay the piper. So if, if we're not making those investments and in helping those countries that need to be helped or helping them help themselves essentially is what we're doing and building those economies to, to the point where we're eventually trading with them and there's, there's you know, right now it seems like we're doing something, but eventually it's going to pay pay back in dividends as opposed to saying, well, you know, we just throw our hands up, we do everything in here, like we are living with a wall around us. We're not. So those investments that are made now help those countries to grow and prosper. And we've seen it done in China. We've seen it done in other countries where they've come from low income to middle income countries. We've seen it happen and we know we're able to trade with them as opposed to just leaving them to fend on their own, having generations of people that are growing up without hope that end up causing conflict. We don't, at, at some point, we're either going to have to have conflict with these countries or we're going to trade with these countries. I prefer to trade with them. True. Um, what was it like working with the Minister of International Development, uh, Miss Marie Claude? I, I forget how to Bebo. pronounce her last. Bebo. What yeah. was it like working with her? Oh, it was fantastic. So she that was her her field before she got into politics. Right. So it wasn't my area of expertise. It was it was actually an area that I could have I learned as much as I was doing the work. So understanding from her the perspective of the importance of international development was critical. The importance of the investments that we're making, the importance of you know, not being sent anywhere to empower anyone or to have some kind of patriarchal kind of relationship, but to actually listen to the needs of the people on the ground and be able to support them as they implement the systems and the processes, the programs that they needed to better their lives. And seeing some of those investments that Canada had made 
especially around a peace and security that have transformed themselves into something that you could actually see tangible results that make places safer and actually make Canadians ultimately safer because the places, you know, especially when we're talking about the Caribbean, where people have uh, access from South America through the Caribbean, uh, through that sort of that, that violence or that drug channel up to Canada to see the investments that we've made in the Caribbean that stop that, 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 that violence and that trade from happening, that illegal trade from happening is, is fantastic. Those investments, that training, that, that uh, security implementation came because we had open relationships with some of our Caribbean partners and we're seeing the benefits of it. Looking, looking back now and looking at the world as it is today, are there things that you see that you were working on as parliamentary assistant to the Minister of International Development that are being fulfilled today? Or is it because when you think of international development, you don't think of the right now in your face newsworthy items. But as someone who was so close to the file, do you pay attention to what's happening with Canada's money around the world and say, I'm glad that they're doing this. I'm glad that we're still working on this file to better uh, the Caribbeans, like you said. Yeah. So the, the Caribbean will be one of the places where I really pay attention to. And especially right now when we're thinking about having when we're having conversations about COVID and reopening after COVID um, around racial disparities all within the context of an existing conversation of climate change. So climate change didn't end when COVID came on board. It's still happening. So all of these things are happening at the same time. And listening to uh, Barbados's prime minister speak a couple of weeks ago or a little while ago at the, at the UN, and she was talking about the fact that, you know, a lot of countries that pledge to help the Caribbean in their quest to build back better after the, the hurricanes, especially the 2015, um, 16, 17 seasons, uh, they did not get, sorry, 2018, especially in Dominica, they didn't get the pledges. And, you know, it really is incumbent about uh, around countries like Canada who have that leadership to be able to say, you know, not only did we give our our pledge, but every other country that pledged as well needs to give because we're going to see the weather continue to get wetter, wilder and warmer. We're having a whole whole nations being shut down because of COVID. So now their economies, which were already very precarious are shut down, we, we can't continue to operate as if we exist in a silo. And it's, it was, it's really good to see continued leadership. Um, it's good to see, you know, Bob Ray at the UN right now. Um, very, very good leadership. Say what you want about the UN. I think they do have some relevance and some important work to do. Um, but it's I, I think Canada has been a leader on the international assistance front. And I would I would be very saddened if that ever went away um, because we're, we're doing work that ultimately protects us and ultimately ultimately we will benefit from. Um, going back to your time uh, as just a sitting MP, just in general, um, you were one of the, if not the only, uh, member of Parliament who was a person of color, female, and uh, let, well, let's call it a black female in a city yes. MP. Did, yeah. did you get, and I know you talked about this a lot in other shows and other interviews, did you feel that it was a place for women of color to be? Because you talk about uh, micro uh, racist aggressions Aggression, that you yeah. felt. Yeah. So how do you break that down? How do you break that down and get more people, uh, women of color to actually run when you are the shining example of what women of color will feel if they go to Ottawa? So that's a great question. <laughs> um, and I'm always afraid when I get this question because um, I felt a lot of guilt when I left parliament. I, I was the only black female 
member of parliament out of 338 members of the 42nd parliament. And so, yeah, I, I do feel, I felt a lot of guilt leaving. Um, but I mean, this past weekend we saw um, enemy Paul be elected as the first black female Jewish uh, leader of a federal party. So we, we know that things are possible. And I, I put out on Twitter, you know, I, I didn't leave a void. We left the door open. Right. Um, so when I left, I wrote a letter to my constituents just explaining me leaving. And I said, you know, I know I have no right to ask any woman to run, especially women of color, especially black women, but I'm going to ask you to run, but run in packs, run. And, and I, I wrote in, in my book about the, the lessons that I, that I learned and why I think I had such a, a hard time. And one of them was because I didn't actually do the pack. I wasn't running in a pack. I knew I had a lot of support, but I really needed to extend my hand to the village of people that I needed support from and get support from them. And I think if we if we were able to do that, if I were to do it again or advise people, it would be to make sure that you have that supportive network around you so that when you're making when you're having those tough uh, conversations or those tough moments that you could draw strength from others in as much as you as in as much as you think you could do it yourself, you might need to draw some strength from other people. So. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, Toronto Centre right now uh, the, at the by-election has a full slate of, uh, of intersecting identities, people with intersecting identities. So I, I just think it's, it's wonderful, you know, people are stepping up. And I think they're stepping up because they see that you could be yourself in politics. You could be real in politics. You could, you don't have to pretend to fit into some kind of pre-existing narrative of what a politician is supposed to be. It doesn't matter who you are, even as a white male, you do not have to fit into a pre-existing narrative of what that needs to be. You can be authentically whoever you are. So I'm, I'm, I'm here for it. I love it. <laughs> One of the most, uh, I would say, uh, prominent uh, forms of micro racial, uh, racial aggression that you felt was from the leader of the People's Party of Canada, Mr. Maxime Bernier. You did not hold bars when he came for you. You came for him right afterwards. Um, when you see people on Twitter, because you probably felt this as a woman, not even a woman of color, but just as a woman, Twitter is a haven for trolls and hate and bigotry. Yeah. How do you deal with that as a sitting MP when it's not just coming from trolls, but it's also coming from people across the aisle from you? Yeah. So I'm here for it. Like, I love Twitter, to be honest with you. People are always telling me, put it down. Do you read your comments? They're so bad. So during the first year, I used to read the comments. Like, Ooh. that is a dumb move. Do not read the comments. I put my stuff on Twitter and I just, I close it. I just let it, I just let it go. What I've been doing though, is I don't block people. I mute people. Ooh. So I want there to be, especially during those four years, if I blocked people, they would not be able to comment on what I wrote. And I wanted there to be a recorded history of what people said about me when I was there. I wanted all that racist, nonsense, sexist, misogyny. I wanted it there. Now, I didn't want to look at it, so I muted it. I just... Mute, 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 mute. <laughs> all day long. I mute people all the time, but their messages will stay there because I, I don't want people to say, oh, you know, Selena said it was so hard there, but look at her, look at her Twitter. Everybody's so nice to her. No, I want them to see all of it. I want there to be a recorded history of what happened while I was there. And so if I block, that's not going to happen. But if I mute, I don't have to listen to a word you say there. That's true. Um, in 2019, at the beginning of 2019, you decide to not run for re-election. Was that a hard decision? Oh, my God. Toughest decision <laughs> in my life. Yeah. Really? It was really. Yeah. After then I, deciding I, to get into politics? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't have left. 
I, I really, really loved that job. Um, I really loved it. Leaving Parliamentary Secretary for International Development, uh, Sherelle Evelyn wrote a, a report on that in the Hill Times. Hardest job, the hardest thing I've ever done because I love, I, even right now I feel emotional thinking, but I loved it. The circumstances that I was in um, prior it, through all, most of 2018 within the Liberal Party, I didn't like. And then when I made the decision to leave the circumstances with the prime minister, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not down for abuse. Mm -mm. I'm not down for that. I'm not, and I wasn't in politics to, to, I wasn't there to fight liberals for the sake of being a liberal. I wasn't doing that. So leaving, leaving and saying I wasn't going to run again was a very intentional decision around some of that treatment. And then sitting as an independent was specifically, sitting as an independent was specifically targeted at just the Liberal Party. I just wasn't interested in, in being part of that anymore. Um, you, uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott, uh, was uh, termed the hardest opposition that Justin Trudeau probably ever had to face because you knew the inner workings of the uh, Liberal Party. You knew uh, what was going on there. Um, the three of you sat as independent MPs for the remainder of the 2019 uh, session after you stepped aside and you were removed from caucus or you left caucus. Um, the three of you, have you become closer friends because of your time sitting as independent MPs? So myself and Jane have always been friends because she was my GP who diagnosed me with depression in 2014. 2014, oh, wow. 2015, I can't remember. Um, but Jody, I really didn't know Jody until after until after my my tweet about <laughs> I, I well, I'm sorry, I know Jody. And well, I, I said I know her, but I didn't really know her, but I knew her well enough to know that what people were saying about it were not true. And um, after that, I was like, girl, who are you? Because you causing me a lot of, to get a lot of smoke. And <laughs> I need to know who you, <laughs> I'm getting heat that ain't even mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have time for that kind of smoke. I mean, who are you? <laughs> so yeah, we got, we, we text each other at least, you know, once every couple of weeks just to see how we're doing and. Oh, that's Check awesome. In. Yeah, yeah. Um, the 2019 election, uh, we saw the just, uh, Justin, uh, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, uh, revealed he had done blackface, not once, not twice, but three times that we are aware of. Let's just preempt that, uh, that we are aware of, because he's not sure how many times he did it, and he yeah. thinks it's two, but then it came out as third. Um, if you were running in 2019, would you have stepped down as the candidate? after seeing what he had done? So, you know, you know what? I actually, I actually am quite surprised that I didn't see that coming um, based on, I didn't run in 2015 because I couldn't run under, I uh, sorry, in 2019, because I would not run under Justin Trudeau. So, that's that's uh, I wouldn't run under him before he did blackface. <laughs> OK. Were you surprised that, of his reaction, of his apology that he the non apology apology that he gave? Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's still it's it, you know, I, th that apology is it's great. You know, would I have a beer with the guy? Sure. Do I think he's a leader? No. I mean, he's doing a job. Right. He's not the barista at the coffee shop. He he wants to be prime minister and therefore you should have enough self-awareness to be leader. And I just didn't feel that he had the leadership qualities that I would want to sit and, you know, say this is the leader that I will follow. I just didn't think he had that. And that was before blackface. So blackface would definitely. Like he wasn't a child when he did it. He was a grown man teacher so now um, 
since then, since 2019, uh, I say since 2019, and it was literally a year ago as we talk, but it seems so much longer in the like end. <laughs> exactly. Um, we have seen the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement across the United States. It is coming here to Canada. It is here in Canada, I should say. Uh, we also have Indigenous Lives Matter here in Canada. Um, as a woman of color, as a former sitting MP, I want to get your reaction to what's going on um, because we currently have one leader of a political party who says Canada is not a racist country. It, uh, we have one uh, leader of a, a political party who says, yes, Canada has systematic racism. Where do you, where, where do you stand on this? So the, the dispute whether Canada has systemic racism or not is, is it's, it's, a, it's a moot. Like we need to just say that, it's, that it is and go on. And, you know, I was looking at Twitter and, and realizing that the last residential school closed in, in 1996. If you can't even just use that as one example of systemic racism within our system, then like, at, like at the very least, be cognizant enough of your own history to know that that at least happens. Okay, you might not know everything or you might not believe everything, but that's a pretty good example. Um, and so, you know, Aaron O'Toole, I'm just gonna leave him parked aside for a second because, you know, I you have a sitting government that is able, that holds the pen on being able to uh, to put forward policies that is that can, say that yes black lives matter and indigenous lives matter now i see the response from mark miller to the death of joyce um esquash and as esquash i'm sorry i'm pronouncing her last name wrong um but the woman who, who died listening to very racist um comments in a on her deathbed i listened to his response and him pushing other governments pushing his own government, pushing other governments as well to do what is right. I think when we look at Justin Trudeau taking a knee at a Black Lives Matter movement and then getting up and, you know, people say to me, oh, well, he put $200 million in a, in a, in a loans for Black owned businesses and that's supposed to be something great. Well, did he get rid of the issues that caused black owned businesses to not be able to access that money in the first place? Otherwise, you're putting two hundred million dollars in a vault and saying that it's something that you did when you did nothing. Yeah. And on top of that, wouldn't it just be easier to allow for black owned businesses to provide their goods and services to the government of Canada, which is the larger procure, the largest procurer of goods and services in the country. Why not just do that? But, but no, you're doing all these little stupid roundabout loop de loop, jump through a fiery hoop kind of crap and Good call, for a press calling, release. It, calling it progress. Yeah. No, we're not here for that. I'm going to continue to push the government now, if Aaron ever gets in, I'll push him as well. And I, I mean, I, I go for him on Twitter sometimes, but this is the government who actually could do something. This is the government of diversity is our strength. This is the feminist government. This is the one that says that they're going to have an intersectional approach to building back better. Define that, please. Yeah. Otherwise, shut up. Like, we need yeah. tangible. We don't need any more words. And in today's, in, in 2020, I just find that uh, with the COVID-19, with everything going on with COVID-19, I think this government has started to fumble the ball a bit in the words of uh, we're a feminist uh, government, we're a intersectional government. It's now a, I don't know what to do government because we're just throwing money and hoping for the best. And that's just from a person who ran for the liberals, who had a falling out with the liberals after that election, who has now seen the true insides of what the liberal government is doing. Yeah. Um, before we wrap this up, I want to talk about what you're doing now. You've talked about it a few times, but I'm going to let you talk about it a little bit more. You have a book. When can we expect to see it on the bookshelves? Yeah, before we go to the book, I actually think, you know, throwing money at a wall and hoping something sticks yep. is not policy. No, it's not. It never has been. <laughs> which, I think is, which I think is what they're doing, and I don't like it. And they, they have 
very, very tangible things that they could do, repeal mandatory minimums, you know, have goods and service procured, other things that they could do that actually will be tangible. But what am I doing now? <laughs> well, I, I, now you've got me off on a tangent now. Do you think, Christine, uh, the new Minister of Finance will be able to do that? Because you had Bill Mon Monroe, who was the former finance minister, who was, let's say, best friends with Justin Trudeau and was willing to basically do whatever he wanted. Christina seems to be a little bit more stand up for herself. Or what's your opinion? So I, I really like Christy. I think that she's she's fantastic. I think she would be great as finance minister and and deputy prime minister still. Um, I don't know. I don't know if if her agenda is as focused on um, intersectionality as as it should be. It, and I think that the individuals that should be advocating for an intersectional lens related to policy and a more tangible intersectional lens are weak willed and they don't have enough gumption to push the government to do what they need to do. They, they're they're af afraid to say what, you know, might get somebody in the center of, of that circle upset. And that could be prime minister, PMO, otherwise, but you need people who are going to be disruptive. And it's not disruptive to the point because you're indicting them. It's disruptive because they promised better was possible. So give us the better. Or, so, or when is it supposed to be possible, right? Yeah. So give us better because that's what we want. I agree. Um, yeah. So now we will talk oh, no. about <laughs> now we will talk about the book. Um, uh, from what I understand, this is a book that's been a few years in the making, correct? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> I've done um, my research on you. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Yes. Yeah, so it's been a few years in the making. So it's not just like a political tell-all, you know, sort of thing. It's um, it really is about the lessons that I've learned throughout my life. So I it, the book is you know I I, I wake up on. March 20th, the day after I became an independent in 2019. And I look back over my life and realize that I've been independent my whole life. And then at the conclusion of the book, wake up on March 20th and look forward and just look at all the promise that we have as Canadians, as individuals who want to run, as individuals who want to smash glass ceilings and bend status quos and things like that. Um, it's that uh, it really is about an awakening a realization of the voice that I've always had and was afraid to use. And when can we expect it on bookshelves? Because I will be the first one buying it. I will be <laughs> buying on Amazon or wherever the heck it's going to be sold to get it because I want to read this. Yeah. So it's called, can you hear me now? And it's available on February 2nd, 2021 at bookstores and online everywhere. Perfect. Selena, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I, I see we're literally just on the hour mark right now. So I, I want to keep to my time that I promised you. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. This was a great conversation and I had some questions that I never, I've never been asked before. So <laughs> well, thank you for keeping me on my toes. Well, thank, thank you very much. It was, it was certainly a pleasure. I'm glad I did it. Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you. Whoa!